for my next video, um, I'd like to talk a little bit, as I've alluded to, to special education services. How we actually respond to students with disabilities. And when I say students with disabilities, I mean students with identified disabilities by a team, um, at least in Iowa, by an AEA team. Um, the state has identified um, AEAs with the responsibility of being the identifying agency, the um, teams of, of professionals that will determine whether or not a student has or does not have a disability. All AEAs handle this a little bit differently. As I said earlier, it's a little bit like states and states' rights. Um, up until this year, the process for identifying a student varied from AEA to AEA. It's only um, in the past, ooh, this year, um, in fact, full implementation isn't even required um, until next year or I think maybe the year after that. Um, how we identify kids, um, it's called Child Find. Uh, and how we identify whether or not a student is an entitled individual um, just became a statewide process. It's going to be really difficult as a rollout because although some places like our AEA, we don't test in place. Um, we look at hopefully student needs um, and look at discrepancy um, between them and their peers and then what's it going to take to get them to be successful um, and start to progress along the general ed curriculum. And if it takes a really significant amount of support and individualized intensive instruction, we call it special ed. Now, one of the reasons the state stepped in um, my, through the series of child find trainings that I've had, one of the reasons the state stepped in was because it, what we were doing wasn't working. It was taking too long. It wasn't time responsive to student and family needs. Um, we were spending too much time trying to get general education teachers to be compliant and do research-based interventions and collect data, uh, making it a data-based decision-making um, system. This response to intervention model has just not been working uh, for a multitude of reasons. One of those being um, how we uh, set up those interventions. First of all, in, in secondary education, which is where I especially um, is, English teachers are literature teachers. They are not reading teachers the way a first or second grade teacher may teach reading and may be knowledgeable about reading strategies. If you look at, I think it was the pre-2004 maybe, um, University of Iowa curriculum for secondary English language arts um, teacher certification. It was really heavy in British or English literature and American literature and um, composition. It wasn't necessarily really strong in reading strategies, comprehension strategies, how to improve fluency, how to teach students to read with prosody. These weren't things that teachers were necessarily taught how to do and yet they'd sit in meetings with struggling with kids that were struggling readers and be told okay you're the English teacher you need to know how to intervene with a student that has a reading difficulty it's not dissimilar with math a, a teacher that excels in instructing or performing advanced mathematical operations may not have an adequate toolkit to help intervene when a student is struggling. And so I think in part we asked a system to do something. That be pick a skill that a student is deficit at, form a 20 to 30 minute daily, weekly, um, structured, intensive intervention that has a research base to it and keep data on it and if the student doesn't make progress after three or four weeks get together again and pick a different intervention. Teachers just don't necessarily have a bag of tricks like that. Um, I'm not going to place blame on necessarily why that happens if it's all teacher prep, if it's partly professional development, if it's partly that the research base is just 
ever so slightly convoluted um, programs, purchase programs, and some of them have great reputations, and some of them have reasonable results. They're not one size fits all. And in fact, a lot of the strategies, the research-based strategies they incorporate, a teacher could, with a little strategy knowledge and a book, a newspaper article, could spend a week teaching reading strategies purely based off of uh, one newspaper article, reading and writing, because I really think they need to go hand in hand. Although, with a disability, they aren't necessarily hand in hand. A whole other topic again. Um, and so I think one of the reasons that we failed miserable, miserably with response to intervention, according to our data, is we didn't have the intervention part. Um, other lesser things were we didn't have the response part. We weren't good at keeping track of data. We weren't good at setting measurable, monitorable goals. Um, then, of course, when we didn't necessarily have the toolkit 60 to 70 percent of the time, I would say, on the secondary level, maybe even 80 percent of the time, to carry out the intervention. How do you measure a response to something when you're not even sure exactly how you're going to teach it? Um, and when you start pulling in things like challenging behaviors, it becomes all the more frustrating. We know that social skill instruction in isolation, even by a trained, wonderful social worker professional, <laughs> isn't all that effective. Uh, it doesn't have lasting effects. It doesn't generalize when you teach a student how to, say, have conversational skills, how to start a conversation, how to disagree um, with an adult, um, how to do confrontation effectively, be assertive, assertiveness training. We know that some of those things don't necessarily work when taught in isolation, and they don't last. Um, they fade. Like any other skill, if students don't truly embrace them, ingrain them, and use them on a regular basis, they don't keep them. Um, and we know that's true with just about anything. But on top of that, these general education interventions, try finding a general education teacher that feels comfortable teaching replacement behaviors when a student's struggling with depression. We were asking teachers to do things way outside their comfort zone and and also things that maybe um, the rest of us, even those so-called experts, had a very limited um, supply of tools around. And I'm not necessarily talking, especially right now, about early elementary. Um, we have tons of great strategies when a teacher is, when, when the whole class is working on phonics and one student isn't getting certain blends, we have great assessments available. We have phenomenal ways of um, whole class work on improving fluency, improving vocabulary and teaching vocabulary skills to entire groups of, of kids is, is, uh, is one of those things that we have a plethora of knowledge about. Um, teaching comprehension skills even to upper, um, to high school age kids. We have a really good knowledge base about designing those in the current system though. Um, I, I hate to bring up the time factor, but time is an issue. When your bell schedule is set up with three minutes in between and 20 minutes, you have to literally be willing to do whatever it takes. Um, you really need to read that book. Uh, and you really need to be able to follow DeFore's suggestions that you create that time, that intervention time, that supplemental and intensive time. Um, and I, I think that because of the lack of all those things, first, and foremost, our identification process hasn't been really effective. In the next video, I'm going to talk a little bit about how I could see it becoming more effective, um, but even less, but I find that even less important as what do we do with students once they're in special education? So that's what I'll be talking about next.